major support for Able to Learn Air. Green Mountain Support Services to empower neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Major support also includes Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Allah Israel, all people, no limits. Welcome to this edition of Abled and On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled in Vermont and beyond. I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Arlene Seiler. Uh, before we get to our um, important guest today, we would like to thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and Ale Israel. Um, we would like to uh, welcome Jim Caffrey of uh, Caffrey Law and the Special Needs Alliance to our show. Thank you. And um, on this uh, topic, we will be discussing special needs trust and special needs law and the differences between all of that. Welcome to Able Then On Air. Thanks to both of you. And You're right. um, what are the misses and goals of your law practice and what kind of law do you practice? Um, so, let's start there. We generally describe what we do in our office as special needs planning, which is primarily. Uh, estate and future planning for Vermont families that are affected by disabilities in some way. Okay. And now, it, it, so that runs the gamut. It can go. It does. It, it, um, what classifies, in terms of your law practice, what classifies what a disability is, the types of disabilities? Because, you know, there's a whole lot of fraud out there that people you know, as far as disabilities are concerned? So in our office, we're primarily concerned, uh, or primarily we're, we're working on planning. And so uh, we don't do social security claims so that would address the, the issues of fraud, possible fraud that you've mentioned. But primarily what we're doing is estate planning for families mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. families in which there is a person with a disability. And as you know, there are there's a wide spectrum of uh, of needs and abilities, and so our planning is tailored to the mm -hmm. needs of that individual family. Typically, that includes uh, all of the traditional estate planning, wills and revocable trusts, health care directives for family members, and then also a special needs trust. Okay. How do you set up a special needs trust? How do you set it up, per se? <laughs> So there are a number of different ways that that can be done. Uh, primarily in our office, we're uh, working with parents who are uh, going to do their own estate planning, and then also they're going to create a special needs trust for a family member with a disability. And so typically it's a parent. Sometimes it is a grandparent. Uh, mm -hmm. And in certain instances, it is the person with a disability, him or herself, mm -hmm. who sets up their own special needs trust. Now, we understand that you're part of the Special Needs Alliance, or you're a member of that. I am a member of that. So what exactly is okay. that group? Uh, so the Special Needs Alliance, or the SNA, is a uh, national association of lawyers that do work similar to what I do mm -hmm. uh, in the special needs planning. And so it's an invitation-only group of lawyers, um, and basically uh, they're looking for folks who've had uh, a certain amount of experience in this area. Uh, we don't have members in all 50 states. We're at about 46 states. We're missing the Dakotas. Um, but that's helpful in case uh, we're working with a Vermont family who moves to California. I will have a colleague that, I can, that can assist a family in a move. Um, Is it, are people, I wouldn't say scared, but people like squeamish with like dealing with end of life uh, stuff like estates. Oh, absolutely. So, <laughs> so uh, many people um, are squeamish so about how do the you, end of how, their own how lives. How do you um, walk them through the steps? What is are ways that you? I wouldn't call them baby steps, but yeah. In a sense. They can be. Um, so, you know, we have a pretty typical uh, process where somebody, uh, some, somebody's going to call our office. Uh, and uh, again, the majority of our work is mom and dad say, okay, we're getting older. We need to do some planning for our son or daughter who uh, has a disability of some kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. then we have a meeting. Uh, you know, we get some information f from them. Mm -hmm. We have a meeting. We talk about the... Uh, their concerns, the, the opportunities, what kind of benefits does your son or daughter receive, where do they live, where do they want to live, 
Um, and so we try to coach them through uh, thinking about all of the hard decisions that they need to make. Um, yeah. And then... Um, hard decisions, explain that. Uh, well, just... Um, right. Uh, if they're going to establish a special needs trust, who's going to be for their son or daughter? Who's going to be the trustee of that trust? Um, and how much money are you going to put in? How, how much, much money are they going to put into how it? How much do they get a month? You know, right? And who's and going to regulate it and stuff? Who's right? going to be the trustee? Are you yeah. going to choose a family member to be a trustee? Are you going to choose a bank or a nonprofit to be the trustee? Nonprofit. Uh, so in the sense you say bank or nonprofit. So if there are no relatives available. You mean like a group home well, or a nonprofit? Or? No, there, uh, there, are, uh, there are some nonprofits, uh, there are none in Vermont, uh, at least none that I'm aware of uh, that are based in Vermont, uh, mm -hmm. but there are some nonprofit organizations whose sole function is to administer special needs trusts. And I've worked with some and that are based in different states, but the beneficiary uh, lives in Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And then, in some instances, uh, the person with a disability might be under a guardianship, right. uh, and then part of the planning with uh, the parents uh, is uh, helping them figure out who's the best choice to be a future guardian. Right. Um, but What's obviously, the definition that's definition of guardianship. Since you said that, what's that? What is the definition of guardianship within all this? So, un under Vermont law, a uh, if a person uh, has uh, uh, an intellectual impairment uh, that um, <laughs> compromises their ability to make uh, medical decisions or financial mm -hmm. decisions on their own. Uh, the probate court will sometimes point, uh, appoint a uh, guardian uh, to serve and then that person has the legal authority uh, to make some of those decisions on behalf of another person. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, um, under Vermont law, there are essentially six powers uh, that are that can be given. You and, mean like uh, a power of attorney type of thing? Well, it's similar to that in that, um, but it's in that the court is giving the legal authority to right. some <coughs> other person to make a uh, decision, uh, make a medical decision or make a legal decision on behalf of the person under guardianship. Um, <coughs> with a power of attorney, that yeah. is the principal, the person, they choose who they want to be their agent, mm -hmm. but right. it, it's similar in the sense that you're giving authority to somebody else yeah. to help mm -hmm. you out. So uh, power of attorney simply means, okay, I'm not gonna be around, example, and <coughs> someone else takes over, is that? Is that so a power of attorney, is mm -hmm. only something that's effective while the principal, and that's the person who's <coughs> giving the power, that's only effective while they are alive. Mm -hmm. So once the person, once the principal passes away, the power of attorney is no longer effective. Mm -hmm. um, but the- So um, then does the state take over? So if the, if the person has passed away uh, and they have assets then, and if they have uh, uh, a will, then the it's not the state of Vermont, it's not the government that takes over, but through the probate court process, an executor or a personal administrator, they're appointed to mm. uh, and take care of affairs after the person has passed away. Okay, now, uh, question. Yes, sir. In, in terms <coughs> of uh, we mentioned a whole lot of stuff. Okay. So, okay. There's a whole lot to. There's a whole lot do. to say. Uh, so, uh, third-party trusts or trusts. Yep. Okay. What's the difference? Because, let's say, example, persons on Social Security or SSI, because there's different types of Social Security. Big difference. Yep. Difference. Okay. How does the First, second, and third party trust work? Well, for reasons I cannot tell you, there's no second party trust, but there are first party trusts and third party trusts. Okay, go ahead. And the third party trust is a trust that is established by somebody other than the beneficiary with a disability. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's a mom and dad, or a grandparent, or a a brother or somebody, they will be the ones that establish the trust 
and other people's money funds the trust. Mm -hmm. It's never the money of the person with the disability if it's going to be a third party trust. Can and the flip, I was going to say, and the flip side of that is a first party trust is something that a person with a disability can establish for him or herself, and if they are not able to do so, a guardian can establish a first party trust. And that kind of trust, mm -hmm. special needs, they're both special needs trust, right. but the first party trust is allowed to receive money that belonged to the person with a disability before it went into the trust. Right. Can Social Security or those government programs take away benefits? What do you mean, can they take away In benefits? In other words, can, uh, will benefits be affected? If you have a proper special needs trust? Yes. No. Okay. No, that's good. So, and, and that's the point of doing I'm the just special. Sad. I ask you so people can, no. Yeah, so that's the point of doing these special needs trusts is that uh, you know, there, there are restrictions involved in the way they, you know, they have, the trustee has certain rules that they have to follow uh, in order, f and, the, and the trust document has to have certain language, and assuming you do all of that correctly, benefits like SSI and Medicaid mm -hmm. will not be negatively impacted. Mm -hmm. w what, what, what way will they be impacted? It, if the trust is not set up correctly? So if the trust is not set up correctly, and again, there are different rules for a first party trust and a third party mm -hmm. trust, but you're correct that if the trust is not set up correctly, mm -hmm. then a person uh, who's receiving SSI uh, or Medicaid, they could lose eligibility for those benefits if it's not done correctly. Mm -hmm. yeah. They could also lose benefits if the trust is set up properly mm -hmm but it's not administered properly. Mm. Uh, so the, the trust has all the right words in it, but the trustee mm. maybe makes the wrong kind of distribution. They right. dole out cash instead of paying, directly paying for an electric bill or something. Uh, so mm. there's two ways that it can be goofed up. One is in the writing of the document. And, and have you seen goof ups where, you have, sure. where, where you've had to fix <coughs> or help fix Issues? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what? Uh, let me see. Is this is this type of law hard to practice? And because we understand that you have a son with a, a challenge. I do. So, how does how does your law practice factor into the fact that you have a family member who is? Um, well, I had a family member with a disability before I became a special needs planning lawyer. Yeah. Uh, I've been a lawyer for 25 years, and mm -hmm. I did different stuff for uh, 12 of them. And then as a result of thinking about these things when um, my son is now 19, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I changed my law practice to do special needs <coughs> planning. Uh, and your first part of your question is, is it hard? It's it, it's complicated. It's, it's, How so? Uh, um, How is it well, there's a couple things. You, you, you need a general understanding of all of the traditional aspects of a state planning law. Uh, and then you need to have an understanding of what the different public benefit programs are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, SSDI is not the same as SSI. No, and it's not and not. Medicaid is not the same as Medicare. <coughs> no. uh, and <coughs> within the Medicaid program, there are lots of different things that are uh, covered uh, within each state. And, and Medicaid, and from one state, you cross the Connecticut River into New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and Medicaid over there is going to be very different than it is here. Right. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's pretty complicated. And, and, and you know, now, um, do you guys deal with, or does your law practice deal with, um, okay, let's say, example, uh, someone passes away, mm -hmm. okay, and there's money in the trust, but there's no money for funeral expenses, or how does that, do, does your law practice step in, or does the state, or can the state help with issues like that? So that's going to depend on a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, if there is a... Uh, that's a bad question. I hope mm. not. No. Uh, if, if there is a third-party 
special mm -hmm. needs trust. Yeah. Uh, and a person passed mm -hmm. away and they did not have a prepaid uh, funeral plan, mm -hmm. then typically the trustee mm -hmm. of the trust, so after the beneficiary has died, the trustee can pay for uh, funeral uh, services. Um, mm -hmm. a, there's a difference with the first party trust because under the first party trust, you're not supposed to pay for the funeral expenses. Mm -hmm. So typically if, if a person only has a first party trust and no third party trust, the trustee can buy the prepaid funeral plan before the person passes away, but they're not supposed to pay for it after the person has died. Mm. That's one of the there, confusing Medicaid rules that, that folks need to Are know. there more expenses? I know this is a question we haven't discussed, but are there more expenses when a person dies than they're alive? More, or more problematic things uh, that go wrong? If it's not set up, if everything is not set up correctly? I mean, there are problems that can happen no matter what. Um, yeah. And typically though, when a person has passed away, and, and you're talking about, you're talking about when a parent has passed away yeah. or the beneficiary uh, who has a disability has passed away? The parent, okay. okay. So typically what happens when a parent has passed away is that is the time that the special needs trust is going to be funded. Mm -hmm. So if a parent uh, has an estate plan and they have two children uh, and they say one half to child A and one half mm -hmm. to the special needs trust of child B, so you go through the administration process mm -hmm. and sometimes in the probate court, sometimes uh, the parents will have a trust. Um, so I guess to answer the question, you know. If, if everything is set up properly, mm -hmm. there won't be any problems. Uh, it takes a lot of steps, but there shouldn't be any problems. Mm -hmm. That said, regardless of how well things are set up, if people aren't inclined to get along or behave well, there can always be problems in the anyway. What, what do you mean? Oh, if somebody might challenge uh, a distribution that is made or challenge um, uh, one of the provisions that a parent has included in their documents. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's any number of things that can go wrong, but part of what we do is try to help folks put together a good plan so that there's less likelihood that things will go wrong. Okay. Um, what have, is there anything we haven't discussed that you think is extremely important with your um, office and well, I, I think the the most important thing is that uh, that people do planning, yeah. uh, and the number that I keep hearing is uh, that, and, and this is whether or not you have a a, a, a child with a challenge or not, mm -hmm. is about fifty percent of the um, of the population has no estate planning at all. Do you, why is, why do you, why Well, because most folks is? don't want to spend time or money think planning for their own deaths. Oh. Uh, because mm -hmm. yeah. it's, you know, I do it every day, but it's not a lot of fun to think about. Yeah. Um, but what type of law were you um, actually um, doing before? Before I was primarily an environmental permit attorney, real estate attorney. Oh, okay. Nothing to do with this. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was as a result of uh, my son's uh, autism diagnosis that I change what I do. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. but there are, um, there are matters in our office where parents have passed away uh, and they didn't do any planning and that's not good. Uh, yeah. So if, the, if they have a child who is on SSI and the parent passed away and they left them a pile of money, whether it's big or small, if it's more than $2,000, mm -hmm. that caused a problem for their SSI and their Medicaid. And then, the, and then their SSI stuff gets shut off, correct? It does, um, you know, and then there are certain, you know, there are things that they can do. Uh, mm -hmm. There are planning, you know, they might be able to establish a first party trust, um, but if somebody is receiving uh, services through an organization like Washington County, so they're one of your sponsors and they've worked with my son, um, that is paid for by Medicaid. Yeah. And so if a parent didn't do any planning and they've passed away and they've left 
again, a small pile or a big pile of money to their child. Does it matter? Is there a big difference between the amounts? Well, generally speaking, that uh, the countable uh, resource threshold, I don't know if you've heard this term, you know, you can't have more than $2,000 in your bank account at the end of the month. I think that's changed, no? Uh, it, well, for certain programs it's changed, but by and large it is still a $2,000 asset test mm -hmm. for if you're on SSI or if you are on uh, certain Medicaid programs. Not all Medicaid programs, mm -hmm. um, but with certain Medicaid programs, there's still this $2,000 asset test. Um, so, And if you go, let's say, 2001, what happens? You got a problem. Well, if you got 2001, you're going to spend the dollar and, and yeah. So the size of the problem mm -hmm. and your planning choices are largely going to depend on the amount of money that um, is left directly to an individual. Um, I don't know if you've heard of an ABLE account. Yeah. Um, yes, we have. Okay. Can you explain how that would work? So an ABLE account is uh, similar to, um, uh, I don't know if you've heard of a 529 college savings plan. Not exactly, but go ahead. So a, a 529 plan is something that parents will do if they think their son or daughter is going to go to college someday, they can put 50, up to $15,000 in this account yeah. and, and it, they save that money for the child to go to college. An ABLE account is something that a parent can establish for their child with a disability or a grandparent or whomever can establish it. And you can put up to $15,000 a year into that account. A year? A year. Okay. Into that account uh, and that money in the ABLE account uh, does not count against the, it's exempt. It doesn't count against the $2,000 mm -hmm. dollar, you know, the, the dollar threshold. Really? Yeah. Okay. Couple things though with that, that the person with the disability mm -hmm. has to have been legally disabled prior to the age of 26 in order to use an ABLE account. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you were in an autom if you weren't disabled previously and you're in an automobile accident at age 30, mm -hmm. you can't use an ABLE account. So, okay. uh, but again, the, the majority of our work is trying to help families plan so you don't have a problem of a parent passing away and all of a sudden causing uh, a, yeah. an eligibility problem. Um, now, um, you said that. $2,000, but see, I'm, I'm a little confused. Maybe okay. you can uh, unconfuse us. <laughs> I hope you, so. You said that $2,000, you're not allowed to have more than $2,000, or it probably- For certain benefit programs, not all of them. Okay, but the ABLE account said you can have $15,000. I'm still confused. So the ABLE account, you're not penalized at all? Exactly. So, oh. and so, um, so you can have, un so under the Medicaid rules, so $2,001 in cash yeah. in your bank account, yeah. that penalizes you. Mm -hmm. But the ABLE account or a special needs trust are exempt assets. Mm -hmm. So you could have a special needs trust with $100,000 in it mm -hmm. and it doesn't count against the $2,000. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. You could also own a house mm -hmm. and a house Cost more than two is worth more than two thousand yeah. dollars. That doesn't count against you. A car, uh, you can own a car, and well, that doesn't count. There against are organizations, by the way, that um, do give cars or modes of transportation to people um, on low income. By the way, you know, mm -hmm. they, there are certain situations like that as well. So, if, if you own a car that's worth two thousand and one dollars, it doesn't matter because a car is exempt. If you owned a car that was worth $20,000, it still doesn't matter because mm -hmm. your automobile is exempt. So my, mm -hmm. my point is that, that there are certain assets, including a special needs trust mm -hmm. and an ABLE account that don't count against your eligibility. And, mm -hmm. and that's part of what we're doing in our offices, trying to help families understand, okay, well, you can do this with the money, but you can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but the ABLE account is, doesn't count what okay uh, so what are the rules simplify it okay um okay for example they have i'm just going to bring up the food stamps for a second within the food stamp program you can buy certain things but you can't buy others 
So within your trust situation, mm -hmm. in terms of what a person can and cannot do, can you, what exactly? So generally speaking, uh, the trustee is, is paying for things out of the trust directly. Uh -huh. So for example, uh, so a, a person with a disability, they're receiving Medicaid uh, and they need a new TV or they need new furniture in their house. The trustee can pay for all of that new furniture and as long as they pay for it directly instead of, so I'm not gonna give you cash out of the trust if, to go buy the furniture yourself, I pay the furniture company directly. Mm -hmm. You get all of that new furniture and it doesn't affect your benefits because right. I paid for all of that so directly rent, out of the trust. Rent? Rent is a little funny. Okay. If you're on SSI and the trustee pays for rent, you might lose up to about $270 of SSI. Wrong. But right. you don't lose your Medicaid. Right. And you don't lose all of your SSI. So How, uh, that's confusing. It is confusing. Okay. So, so they're so not rent, allowed to pay rent, rent? Rent and food, well, it, you're allowed to. It just means that there might be a reduction in your SSI. Mm. Mm. So it is, and you're absolutely right, it is confusing. Mm. So I could pay for your, uh, you know, if I'm the trustee, I could pay for your cable TV bill uh, $100 every month, no impact on your SSI, no Cell impact. Cell phone. Cell phone. For the person. Yeah. Sure. So let's say I spend, uh, if I'm the trustee of the trust and I spend $200 a month on uh, a cell phone and a cable TV bill. If I spend that same $200 and pay it to the landlord for rent, the SSI is going down by $200. Uh, mm. What about clothes? Uh, clothes are okay, you can pay for clothes. Okay. Uh, the rule changed on clothes. It used to, clothes used to be included with food and rent. Uh, as something that you might receive a penalty and reduce your SSI. Mm. Mm. But if I'm paying for food or rent, there might be a reduction in SSI. How long do they give so you can include it in that? But if, well, so what I was gonna say is, but mm -hmm. if, um, if the person is on SSDI, there's no impact on the SSDI if I pay the rent. Wow. Really? Really. Wow. That's kind of funky. <laughs> yes, it is kind of funky. Yeah. So, yeah. so it is, so, and, and the names are, you know, SSI versus SSDI, Medicaid mm -hmm. versus Medicare. Mm -hmm. It's confusing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and again, if you're on SSDI, I can pay some of your rent and mm -hmm. there's no impact on your SSDI. Suppose SSD. if it's a medical expense that your insurance will not pay. Uh, that's surgery. A, that's a great use of special needs trust money. Uh, you can surgery of pay some sort. So if if you're on Medicare and Medicaid and you want to try some experimental treatment or no, if you need so a person needs a surgery for a pacemaker or something that something like that is probably going to be covered mm -hmm. yeah. under the Medicaid or Medicare programs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I certainly don't know each and every procedure that's covered. Yeah. But so something like a pacemaker or you know, open heart surgery, that is likely to be covered by your publicly funded yeah. healthcare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, have had, um, we have had trustees, we've worked with trustees that are paying for maybe something like additional massage therapy. You know, maybe your insurance only pays for 10 sessions of massage therapy. Or uh, what about additional, let's say? Acupuncture. Acupuncture, sure. physical therapy. Sure. Stuff like that. You can pay for those things out of the trust yeah. without having a negative impact on your Medicaid. Vacations, does yes. it pay for that? Yes, it can. Okay. Up to 30 days if you're on S, if, uh, 30 day, if you've left the state for more than 30 days, uh, that can create an issue for Medicaid. But yes, generally speaking, vacations can be paid for. Mm -hmm. uh, in some instances, if the person who's the beneficiary of the trust, who's a person with a disability, if they can't, if they need assistance to go on vacation, they need it, if they have mobility challenges or health challenges, 
the trust can not only pay for them to go on vacation, it can also uh, it can also pay for a caregiver. I am okay. Hold on. Um, they can the trustee can also pay for uh, a companion, a necessary uh, companion, a personal care attendant. Well, wouldn't wouldn't Medicare and Medicaid pay for that? Doesn't that cover that? I mean, Medicare and Medicaid generally aren't paying for a companion's airplane ticket to go to Florida. Oh, okay. Mm. No, do they pay for an aid? I'd say you need an aid. So if you need an aid and so for some folks, they've got a limited number of hours that you've right. got a Medicaid funded uh, PCA or care attendant. Right. So um, if Medicaid is only paying for a certain amount, the trust can pay for additional hours. Mm. Um, no. And again, they could pay for the airline tickets if you were going on vacation, as you said. No. Um, end of life. Would the trust be able to pay for hospice care? Or is that, or hospice care? To the extent that wouldn't be covered by an existing pro, I mean, that, yeah. again, that is likely something that, uh, and I'm not 100% certain, but that's likely to be something that's covered by uh, your public health care programs. So you should Medicare, Medicaid, and Medicare, that. Medicaid, you should need the trust to pay for hospice. Mm -hmm. um, if it wasn't covered, sure, the trust could pay for that. Nursing homes too? Uh, again, generally speaking, uh, nursing homes are going to be paid for. Um, Medicare is not going to pay for a nursing home beyond 120 days. Mm -hmm. But typically, folks who are eligible for uh, Medicaid, <laughs> uh, if their health uh, is such that they require a nursing home level of care, Medicaid mm -hmm. will pay for that. Well. So, um, is there anything? So can, there's a lot we, of things that the trust can anything do. Anything we have eight minutes. Is oh. there anything that we haven't covered? Uh, I don't. You know, I, 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 there's not anything that I can think of off the top of my head that we haven't covered. Um, and, and again, a lot of what we're doing, in addition to drafting these documents, is providing education to family members um, when uh, ab about what they can and cannot do with the trust. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, part of our work is sometimes includes. Uh, if there are parents who are getting divorced and they have a child with a disability, sometimes we get involved in that, uh, those kinds of Is matters. That kind of, it gets kind of strange with that particular thing? Well, I, so I'm not a family law lawyer, but sometimes I'll get involved, if there's a person with a disability involved in a, that's part of a family where there's a divorce going on. Mm -hmm. Again, the majority of our work is helping people understand what they can and cannot do with with benefit programs, and as we talked about, they're very different. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah. a, again, different in terms of from state to state. Uh, well, some benefits are are the same. Some benefits are federal, so they're not different state to state. But again, they're different between SSI and SSDI are very.